This morning, um, we have three scriptures that I'm going to look at. Two of them are from the same chapter in Proverbs, chapter 17, and one from 1 Kings. If you want to read along, you can find them in your pew Bibles, starting on page 461. And if you want to read along on the overheads, they will also be up there. This is Proverbs chapter 17. I'm going to read verse 28. As you read the Proverbs, sometimes some of them sound, uh, well, for lack of a better phrase, old school. Some of them don't translate well from Hebrew, and some of them translate just fine. This is Proverbs 17, verse 28. Now even fools who keep silent are considered wise, for when they close their lips, they are deemed intelligent. Maybe we should hear that again, since I didn't hear enough laughter or thought. Even fools who keep silent are considered wise. For when they close their lips, they are deemed intelligent. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19. This is on page 255 in your pew Bibles. This is the story of uh, Elijah. Uh, one of the many stories about Elijah. This is one of the more famous ones. A little context to where we're at in the scriptures when this happens. Elijah has already done many acts and wonders, miracles, in fact, shown that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. You recall that uh, Elijah existed at a time when the king, uh, who was anointed by God, decided to marry a woman from outside of his kingdom, and she brought with her foreign gods, and he allowed the foreign gods to become worshipped rather than the one true God. And they had started worshipping Baal and Asherah and these false gods, and they started tearing down the monuments to the one true God and putting up these false idols monuments. And uh, at this point, Elijah had even gone so far as to challenge the false prophets to prove that their God was real. He had gone up on a mountain which had been dedicated to God where they had torn down one of the altars to God. And he rebuilt the altar in front of all these people and these hundreds of these other prophets. And he was the only prophet there worshiping the one true God. And he asked them to sacrifice a bull and to put it on an altar they had, they had made for their gods and to call upon their gods to light the altar on fire and that the fire would prove whose God was real and whose God wasn't. And after spending almost the entirety of a day trying to get this fire to be lit by calling upon their God and nothing happening, he took a pile of wood, put it down next to his little rock pile that he had dedicated to the one true God. He doused it in, in water, so much so that it flowed around it. And then he sacrificed the bull on top of it and he called upon the name of God and God sent fire down from on high and lit the thing alight. And he had all these people converted back to worshiping the one true God. And then they drug the, 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 the enemy prophets, all these hundreds of men. The, the crowd that was gathered around believed now in the one true God, so they gathered together the false prophets, they drug them down the mountainside, and they killed them. And then the queen, who wasn't there, heard about what happened, and she sent her army after uh, Elijah to capture him and to kill him. She promised that she would do the same to him that he had done to her prophets. And so Elijah fled, and he ran, and he ran by himself, and he went into the wilderness, and he, he, he asked for God to let him die. Because even though he could call upon the power of God, and even though he could convert people's thoughts by based on physical acts that he could do through the Spirit of God, he felt alone in this world. He felt that no matter what he did, there was always going to be someone powerful, in particular these king, this king and this queen, who could undo everything that he had attempted to do. And he felt that it was just time, his time was done. He asked God to let him die. And he kept going into the wilderness and he found his way to this mountain and up to a cave. And he hid in the cave. And then we get to these verses. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 11. 
The voice of the Lord spoke. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, a great earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, a massive fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard the silence, he wrapped his face and his coat and his mantle and he went out, and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of armies. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars, and they have killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. I'm intentionally cutting the story short here. I'll bring it back up in the message. Your final scripture is back in uh, Proverbs 17. This time we'll read a verse that comes a little earlier from the one we read. This is Proverbs 17, verse 17. Now a friend, a true friend, a real friend, loves at all times. And kinsfolk, or family, they are born to share adversity. This morning I'm doing a sermon that is a follow-up from last week's sermon. If you heard what I spoke about last week, or even if you didn't, I'll give you a little recap. It's a message about listening. I challenged you all to consider, to, to think about this verb that we call listening, and how in our modern time, I believe it is under threat. The listening has stopped being an action and started becoming more of a passive thing that just happens when you're around things that cause a noise. The more and more in our society, we create distraction. We create things that bombard our eyes with screens that are constantly in front of us. And yes, they include noise that comes along with those screens, but it is just that most of the time, many times, noise. It is not communicating many things of value, of content, of thought-provoking. And more often than not, and most significantly, it is creating enough distraction, enough connectivity, that in spite of a world we are more and more connected with the people that are in it through this technology, we are less and less actually talking to one another, less and less actually listening to the content of what someone else is saying, more and more looking for the opportunity to say what we wanna say next in whatever form that is, be it on the internet or be it in live ears in front of you. So much so that I challenged you all with this idea. When was the last time you sat down or had a conversation or even an argument with somebody where you really felt listened to? Because more often than not, more often than I care to admit, in our culture around, when you, even when we're talking with a live, living human being in your presence, it's not so much that they're there to listen to you as it is to opportunity for them to speak. And this is a self-reflexive comment, not just what the others are doing, but what we are doing too. That it's more about us getting our voices heard, our ideas trumpeted out for the world to see and to hear, than it is about us actually listening to the content of what others say, much less what's coming out of our own mouths, our own fingers, our own ideas. Listening is an action, it's a verb. It is something that you can choose to do intentionally or something that you just passively let happen to you. And this is a sermon that follows up on it. The content of this sermon has to do with the idea that I've given you as a title for my message, printed in your bulletins, a ministry of presence. Now, I don't mean just because today is my birthday, presence with a T. I mean presence, being present in front of someone else, actually physically being there with intention, with meaning, with value, with eyes that see and ears that hear, says the Lord in our scriptures. Brothers and sisters, this is not about whether or not you physically can see or you audibly can hear. 
This is about whether or not you actually see what's really going on and hear the real content of the life and the nature of the world around you. For you see, there are billions upon this planet with eyes and ears that work to more or less degrees. But very few, increasingly few among us, in spite of the billions more than there have ever been, who really see the world around them and really hear the people and the content of what's happening, who understand the truth of what is abundant in front of our eyes and our ears, and are not just blinded by the daily acts, blinded by the, all the distractions, blinded by the realities and the difficulties around us, but actually hear and see what is happening. This is what is meant, eyes that see, ears that hear, understanding the deeper realities that are constantly around us. This morning I read to you first from a scripture uh, from Proverbs uh, 17, 28. Even fools who keep silent are considered wise. When they close their lips, they are deemed intelligent. To challenge you with something that has been around for a long, long time. I believe we live, as the scriptures say, as Jesus says, in a world that is upside down. And that though we have this technology which allows us to be more communicative and interacting with people than ever before, that we are more often and most often and vast majority of the time using it for foolishness, using it for things that do not matter, or increasingly so, using it to do harm to one another. All you have to do is look at our elected officials, both sides of the aisle, guilty of this using it to fling mud in one another's faces, using it to denigrate each other, using it to tear one another down rather than do anything that might actually build us up. Foolishness. Word that we were to close our lips more often, to listen and to see what is really happening. Maybe some intelligence would be shared. This morning I want to give it to you in a more uh, a physical way rather than just this challenge of the concept of active listening. I gave you the story of Elijah and how he ran from what was happening in front of him. He, you know, he, he was a person that was uniquely gifted with the Spirit of God, and we believe that the Spirit of God indwells in us in a way that is more akin to the prophets of old than it was to of the, the multiple billions and trillions of people that have come around and since and before. The Spirit of God broke into this world in a new and different way when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. That the veil that separates this life, the curtain that only allows us to, to glimpse a little bit of the light coming through, the window that is so foggy that we can't really make out anything on the other side of this world to the next, just the hints of light poking through, that it was cracked just a little bit more when Jesus lived and died, and that, that Spirit flows through that crack to us in new and different ways. And Elijah had it in abundance. He could do things that most of us could never dream of. He had a faith that was deep-seated. And yet when he faced the hardships of this world, when he faced people who would not listen, when he found a king and a ruler, the establishment of his time and his place, that would do the opposite of what God wanted, that would raise up the things that are upside down in this world, that would use their power, their wealth, their prestige. Sound familiar? to do things that are absolutely despicable in the ways of treating one another and talking about one another and in trying to supposedly work with one another and yet actually taking people's lives from them rather than building one another up. This is the reality of his king and his queen of his day. It is not so different from our own. And he met with that and he ran from that reality because he finally had enough. He was fed up. He was ready to be done with this life. He was hiding in a cave on a mountainside, and God showed up. For a man who could call upon God, fire from on high, and light a doused pile of wood, you would think you wouldn't necessarily need God to show up, and yet he needed God to show up. And this, this is the key aspect of what happened and why I read this story. Because it wasn't in the earthquake, it wasn't in the tornado or the hurricane that passed by, it wasn't even in the fire. You know, we talk about acts of God. You use it, they use it in, uh, 
insurance lingo to describe these very actions. When a hurricane comes, when a tornado passes through, when an earthquake happens and it shakes the ground and it rips buildings and homes apart, when a fire ravages the place in which you dwell, or the whole land of half of California or the majority of Australia, or places where it is just ravaging our planet more and more. When these destructive acts happen, they refer to them as acts of God because places frequently in the Old Testament interpreted them that way where God put his thumb upon the existence here in this world and either punished people or took some people down in order to raise others up and use these physical acts, these, these, these natural occurring events, these things which we are coming to more and more understand that are actually, and more and more reality, influenced even by our own actions and interpreted them as willful acts of God. I challenge you, brothers and sisters, to think about what this scripture gives in terms of a counter message. That when the tornado and the hurricane and the winds blew by that ripped rocks asunder, God wasn't in them. That when the earth shook and the mountains started to crumble around him, God wasn't in that. That when the fire ravaged the whole mountainside and burned it to a crisp, God wasn't there either. That God was actually in the silence that followed. I want you to think about what that really could mean. You know, there's lots of issues that happen in our world today. Hurricanes that ravage many of our cities in America, fires that ravage parts of our West and other countries abroad, earthquakes which rumble, diseases and viruses which are new among our increasingly overpopulated planet, and yes, I'll say it, overpopulated, that we are doing things that are challenging in this world. And yet some of it is a consequence of our actions. Some of it is influenced by us. Some of it is beyond what we know and understand. Some of it happens for reasons we still don't quite have to add up. And maybe there are times when God is using even those actions, even those bigger forces of this world to work out his existence. In fact, I believe God has a plan for all of it. And that even if it's broken or the symptoms of brokenness of this world, if it's the actions of willful, neglectful demons and negative forces, or if it's the consequences of us and our sinfulness and our brokenness, whatever the causes are, that the things that are happening on this planet, God will work ultimately for his good. And yet I challenge you to think, brothers and sisters, where God is more often in our lives. That God is not just the God of what happens when the hurricane comes. For God was the God before the hurricane was there. God was the God when the eye of the hurricane passed over. And God will be the God when the hurricanes have long since stopped spinning on this planet. God says, I am the God. Not just when the hurricanes or the floods or the earthquakes or the fires happen. Perhaps sometimes God is in the midst of them for intention. God will use them even if it's just the brokenness of this world that is actually being proclaimed. But God is also the God and more often the God, and daily the God, when the sun rises in the morning, God says, I am. When the sun sets in the evening, God says, I am. When the wind blows every time you step outside, God says, I am. When you deep breathe the breath of life every moment in and out, God says, I am. When your heart beats, and you breathe your weakest at your last, and you exhale a shallow breath and take no more in, God says, I am. God speaks in all of these other moments throughout all of our lives, in the times when there doesn't seem to be a sound being made, God is saying, I am. If you have eyes that can see, and more importantly, ears that can hear the truth of what is happening around you, God is screaming, I am, in the midst of the silence, in the midst of the noise, in the eye of the hurricane, and on the day when it seems like nothing is happening, when you're hiding in whatever cave of a moment of your life, God is saying, I am. And so I think perhaps another way to look at this story, I think maybe, maybe when we read this story, it, it's being told so quickly that maybe we're missing a little bit. I'll give you a little bit of a different way to think about it. Maybe it was a moment like Jonah when Elijah's hiding in this cave, even after all the things he's done and miraculous works, and he's run from the king and the queen who are pursuing them to kill him with their army, and he's hiding on this mountainside, and God speaks to them in the midst of the cave, 
and says, I am coming, come out and meet me. I have a message for you. And then the tornado comes, and then the earthquake shakes, and then the fire ravages. I think Elijah perhaps is still hiding. I think perhaps all these other things are the moments of the shaking life that's happening around him. I think perhaps many of these are the metaphors of what has happened in his life, that all of the difficulty and the destruction is adding up to a, a moment in his life and he keeps hiding in the cave. The winds come and shake the mountain and rip the stones asunder, and he hides. And God breathes, and silence occurs. The earthquake comes and shakes the mountain, and the very foundations of the earth seem to fall apart, and then silence comes. The fire whips up the entire mountainside and the whole wilderness around and burns everything to the ground, and then, the silence comes. And Elijah's still hiding in the cave. And God speaks, come out, you of little faith. Come out, you who have eyes and ears that have seen and have heard and yet still can't understand, still can't really see, really hear. Come and stand in my presence and I will tell you face to face. Brothers and sisters, this is the challenge that I want you to think about. The same God who spoke to Elijah in a voice that his ears reverberating could no longer deny is the same God that speaks to each of us in our lives. In so many ways, trying to tell you not only that God is, that I am, but to tell you that you are and that you have a purpose and a calling in his life, that you do not walk no matter where you go, no matter what the earth can throw at you, no matter what the forces of evil can raise up or tear down, no matter who in your life supports you or walks away from you, no matter what disease can ravage your body, no matter nothing in this life, God is and is in your life and is calling to you. In the sheer moments of silence, when you feel alone and lost, God is saying, I am. Now this, brothers and sisters, can be hard for us to know, hard for us to see and to hear. For most of us have not spent our lives, even as adult Christians, and I think perhaps as much now as ever, really practicing, really trying to train our eyes to see and our ears to hear. This is what our houses of worship should be. We should be spending time challenging one another, strengthening one another, sharpening one another in these midst of moments of seeming silence in between so that when the earth shakes and when the winds tear asunder, when the fire ravages, we are not lost in our little hidey holes all alone, but we know that we can stand in the eye of the storm. We can walk through the midst of the fire and know that whether we, our bodies are consumed in the process or whether we come out the other side, God is with us nonetheless then nothing in this world, even it would take our lives, cannot separate us from him. This is the message we are supposed to be doing. This is what the practices we are supposed to be doing. So see, ripping the scales off of our eyes and the plugs in our ears so that we can see and hear. And this is one of the basic ways you can do this, brothers and sisters. I'm gonna give it to you now. And it comes for your final verses that I read to you from Proverbs. It's a simple teaching that comes before even the message about the fools. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and kinsfolk, family, are born to share adversity. Now, I know many of you have friends that fail you, have friends that are your Facebook friends and are just that, fair-weather friends, if at all, friends only online, if anything better. I know many of you have family that have failed you, that have been enemies more than real family, that have abandoned you in times of need, that have harmed you when they were trying to raise you rather than built you up. I know many of you have been burnt by these words and these phrases, but brothers and sisters, we are called to a different kind of family in this space. We are called to a deeper level of friendship than ones that our world teaches us about our throwaway, our thousands on the internet. No, we are called to look at each other for who we truly are. And this is the opportunity that you have, a physical thing you can practice, a thing you can do that can strengthen you, sharpen you, teach you as well as the others around you during these moments of seeming silence in between the storms of our lives so that we can be strengthened for when they come. 
It is simple. It is a ministry of presence. I remember when I was in seminary, I had a professor who stood up and we were reading some of these old, he was an Old Testament professor, reading them one day, and we were talking about one of these stories about being present in people's lives. And he said, I'm going to testify for you right now and share my story. He said, many of you will become pastors or ministers or priests, and you will be called in the moments where people lose the loved ones of their lives, have difficult moments of real loss and hardship and pain, and you'll be called to show up, to be present in that moment. But I want to tell you now, this is what he said, that you do not have to have the ability, you do not have to have the knowledge, and you do not need the words to show up in those times, in those places. In fact, more often than not, the words aren't there. And if they aren't there, then don't speak them. You don't need them. He said, he and his wife had one little girl, and she was, I forget how old, six, seven, somewhere in that range. They were driving in their car one day, and something happened in a traffic scenario. A car hit them, and their daughter died. The two of them survived, but their one little girl on this earth left it in a tragic way. And people came, all kinds of people came, to the memorial and to the reception afterwards. And he said people had words, lots and lots of of words, empty, heartless, often more words for themselves, trying to make, to fill the silence, to fill the emptiness, to fill the moment because they felt bad and we're taught in our culture that we all must be white knights, we all must have solutions, we all must be better than, we all must have something to say, but you don't need it. And he said when they would say their empty words, some of their phrases, things like, God must have just needed another angel for his choir. He wanted to punch them in the face. He wanted to rip out their hearts and say, if that's the God you worship, then I don't worship any God that you know. What God is it that steals little children so they can have voices in his choir? These kinds of thoughts, these kinds of words were not helpful. They were even hurtful in that moment. And he said, but... Out of all these hundreds of people that came and many who said things that were thoughtless at best or hurtful, even more so, there was one friend who came at the end. When everyone else left and had gone back home, a friend came and knocked at his door. And he opened his door and a friend said, I got a couple sentences I want to say to you. One is that I'm truly sorry. And the second is that I feel like you need some presence in your life. And so I'm gonna go sit in your front room of your house and I'm just gonna be here for a while. And you all, you and your wife, just do whatever you feel like you need to do. But I just want you to know that I'm going to be here. And he said his friend went and sat in his front room in one of his chairs and was there for like a couple of hours. He said he went about cleaning up and doing different things they had planned to do, knowing in the back of his mind that his friend was just sitting there. He said eventually he went and sat in the front room with his friend. But they said no more words, just sat in silence. And he said eventually his friend got up and left and said goodbye and left. He said, you know, it was one of the more profound, powerful things that anyone did at anything related to that incident and moments around the losing of his daughter, just being present in his life. Some of you will remember a story that I shared some years back when I was doing an internship in a hospital where parents um, had come in because their 16-year-old son had shot himself in the head and was dying in our hospital, and I was there in the emergency room. I won't retell the whole story. I spoke to you then a, a, a message about power and powerlessness. But really, put simply, it was a message about what I'm trying to testify, about a ministry of presence. I was taught in an extreme moment when I had nothing to offer to a, a father who was losing his only son, who at the moment when they found out that though the body of this boy was still alive, his brain was gone and he would never wake up. And he's feeling claustrophobic in this little room and he said, I gotta go walk outside. And I had known from sitting with him for the first couple hours that there was a, a liquor store down the street he was tempted to go to. And I knew from looking at him that he was potentially gonna go into shock and he could die walking around this building and looking at all the other adults much older than myself in the room, the medical professionals and thinking nobody, somebody should say something and not let this man walk by himself. 
but knowing they all had other jobs or maybe being mixed up, I'm looking and thinking, who? Lord, someone, someone needs to go with him. Who can go with him? And I had a reflexive moment. I thought, God, I'm somebody. And so I asked him, do you want someone to walk with you? And he said, maybe that's a good idea. And I walked with him. And I had nothing to offer him. I listened to him rail about what the injustice was, about concerns about how he had raised his son, about his own addictions and issues of his own life, about injustice. And all I could say at any given moment was, you're right, it's not right. It's wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't understand either. And just walk with him more often than not, saying nothing at all. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, the next day when I came in and I met his AA sponsor and they were deciding to donate his son's organs to help others to survive, that a piece of his son would live on in other young people's lives. And I had been talking with this AA sponsor. He came out and he introduced himself, him, me to the AA sponsor. He didn't know how long I had been there. And he said, this is Pastor Tyler, though I was not a pastor at the time. And he said something that reminded me about what I'm trying to tell you about. He said he was with me during my darkest hour. And this, brothers and sisters, is not about what I did for him, for I changed zero reality in that moment. I had nothing to offer. I was an early 20-something with even zero, even less interrelatability than I have now with a son of my own. But it wasn't about me who was present with him in that moment. It was speaking a truth that we can represent in others' lives. You see, God has made a deal with this earth and he's explained it to us in pretty simple terms. But it's something that we have a hard time getting through our minds because it's difficult to see and to hear with our human ears and our human eyes. It goes something like this, that God has chosen to hem himself in so that he's not in all and through all in this world, that this life has a purpose, that separation from God in this life, though he is always with us and around us, we are not fully in his presence. So the kingdom of God is here and now, it is not fully here and now, that God has chosen to let us live in this world that is somehow with him but also not fully with him for a purpose. This life has a reason that we become something more in living it, even going through the hardest things, that we can learn more through the hardest moments than we can the easiest in our lives, that we become something new and different at the resurrection by going through this life is a gift, but a challenging one at its core. But God has said, in this moment, in this life, you people, can experience my Holy Spirit. And you, people, when someone else is going through that moment, can embody me to them. Jesus put it way more plainly, and Paul tried to put it in physical terms. We can be his physical body to others in their moments of need if we are willing to show up. I saw it in the soup kitchen almost on a daily basis, a battle between good and evil, light and darkness. You could almost touch it and taste it. It was there if you just had eyes and ears to see. And it was, it was my belief that the Spirit shows up in the places where there's groups or individuals, when you are in the lowest valleys of your life, when you are walking in the midst of that fire and that destruction, the Spirit is even brighter still, but it is looking waiting for just one person, one willing heart, one willing soul with a little bit of eyes and ears to see, to fill up, to shine through our brokenness, our cracks, our flaws. The very things that make us weak, the Spirit uses to be strength outside of ourselves. That if just one willing soul would show up in that moment, be present in their lives, the Spirit can do its work through you even when you have nothing to offer them but your physical presence in their lives. This, brothers and sisters, is a thing not just for me to do. It is a thing for us to do. This ministry of presence is a tool and a gift by God. It is something the Spirit can empower through all of you and is supposed to be doing in your lives, showing you when you're in your higher moments or working up those mountainsides what God can do through you to the po folks who are in a low moment, so that when you reach those low moments, you aren't as much hiding in a hole yourself, but expecting someone else to come along, waiting for the good Lord to show himself through the strength of another's presence in your life. I offer to you, brothers and sisters, this is an action that we can put into practice. It's something that I have witnessed and seen, I have heard from the experiences of others, I have done in others' lives and had done to me 
You can participate in this. This is not a highfalutin concept. This is something you can do. And it is my prayer for all of you that you would not just have eyes to see and ears that hear the world for how it truly is, but that you would put them into practice, being a gift, a true ministry, a servant of presence in others' lives, and thereby be the I am in the moments of need. Amen.